Okay, today we're going to continue our learning. Masechet Shkalim, Daf Tet Vav, page 15. We are nearing the end of this Masechet. It kind of just started and we're already almost finished. Um, we'll have a siyum on Sunday at 8.30 Israel time and 1.30, let's say, uh, Eastern Eastern Daylight time and, or Standard time. I forget exactly how it all works. But anyway, and then all the other times, basically, we'll, we'll announce it. We'll send out an invite. It'll come, uh, it'll come in a few days. Okay. Uh, today's dedications. A week of learning is sponsored by Tina Lamb and Dodie Lamb in memory of their beloved mother-in-law and aunt, Mrs. Mandy, uh, Mindy Lamb. Mindel Bat Shlomo Vitova Hesse, whose first year at site was on Achron Shal Pesach. We miss her love, her elegance and beauty, and her fierce dedication to family and to Torah more than words can say. Today's daf is sponsored by Achsa Weinberg in memory of my cousin, Ketzia Frankel, a woman of love and chesed, an exemplary daughter and sister, an exemplary mother and safta, a tamidah chachama, who, um, who held V'ahavta L'Reacha as her motto. Ketzia was taken from us this, from this world on the 17th of Nisan, 5781, this year, Cholam O'ed Pesach. I miss you already. And by Tamar Orwell in honor of Shira and Chamutal. With gratitude for your spirit and joyous learning and teaching Talmud and for bringing the conversations, dilemmas, personalities, commentaries, and lessons from the pages in compelling ways, both fun and serious. And, in, and by Gita Neufeld in honor of our intrepid die and the cookbook crew for enhancing our physical enjoyment of the Chag while the Hadron Shir enhanced the spiritual side. Things are always better with the daf and chocolate. Thank you for that cookbook. I enjoyed some of the recipes from there too. Okay, we will start with our really interesting daf. Already yesterday, we got to a lot of interpersonal issues and business dealings and all that. Today, we will continue. We're going to finish off the beginning part about the Nisachim, which are maybe a little more tedious. And then we're going to move on to all sorts of interesting things, including what's the best way to give staka, how to treat people who are blind um, in a respectful manner, all sorts of interesting things where sometimes you feel like the rabbis were a little early in their time and really foresaw what took people to only in the last number of years really understand. Okay, let's try, let's start with the Gemara on at the bottom of Yudalad Amubet. So we saw the way it worked in the temple. People would go and they would give money to Yochanan. Again, this was just describing a certain blip in history where Yochanan was the one in charge and Achia was in charge of the Nisachim. So you would give money to Yochanan. He would give you a token. You would take that to Achia and he would get right. I think it's Achia. Yeah, Achia. And he would give you the Nisachim, the wine, the oil, and the flour that you needed for your offering. And again, it depended what kind of animal you had. So we saw there were four types of tokens. Egel, right, cattle. Zachar, which is the Ail, the ram, which is a two, a, an, um, a sheep in its second year, a male sheep, a gdi, which is everyone else from the sheep goat family, and a chote, which is a mitzora. The mitzora, what was the difference in the mitzora? So the a regular gdi, anything in the, that family, you would bring three log of oil. When it came to the mitzora, he needed more. He needed, he took two kvasim, one for uh, an ola, one for an asham, a guilt offering and a burnt offering. And he brought a kivsa, a female one, a female sheep, for a, um, a chatat, a sin offering. So he needed three times three, that's nine, but he also needed this additional tenth load, because if you remember, the Mitzorah goes to the Lishkata Mitzorahim, which was this room that was right before the entrance to the Azara. He wasn't allowed in the Azara, and they would put oil on his ear, his right ear, right ear, and his right finger and his right toe, okay? And so the, he would need an extra log of oil for that. So because it wasn't the same amount that you would use normally for a gdi, instead of giving him three gdi tokens, and there is no token for one log, so there was a special one that you would get 10 log of oil for. That was called the chote, okay? They called him a chote. Some people say because he sinned, and that's why people think lepers is because you sinned. Some people say, no, it's milashon lechate, to, to purify, and he needs purification. So from the lashon chitoy, like to dis, uh, disinfect. Right, in our language, it means disinfect. They're meant to purify. Ben Azai said there was a difference between the chote dal and the chote ashir. Because the chote dal, what would he need? He only brought one, one animal and two birds instead. The ola and the chata were birds. Only the asham was brought with a sheep. He would need three log for the sheep plus one for the oil, the extra oil. 
So he would need four logs, so that one was a four log, as opposed to everything else, which was either three, six, right, three, six, or, sorry, three, four, or six. He could have gotten one, the four, which is the Zahar, but he's not bringing an aisle, so it doesn't make sense for him to do that. So according to Ben Azai, there was this extra one called the Chotei Dal. So now we're going to talk in the Gemara about what's the difference. Ben Azai, Chotei Dal Lama, Hayamivi Logoimo, because he would need four, right, three for the Gdi and one extra one. So because of that, he has his own separate token. Beram Rabbanan, maybe Gdi. The Rabbanan say, no, he just brings the Gdi. And the assumption is, the refresh will explain, according to the rabbis, the extra log he would bring on his own. He wouldn't buy it in the temple. He would bring it from his house. He would bring that extra log of Shem and he didn't need to buy it in the temple. And that, that was different than the one that gets offered with the Korban. And therefore, he would just bring a regular Gdi and there was no need. Niske Rachel Ma. So now, the Niske Rachel, this is a, a, a U, they call it, right? An E-W-E. Um, this is a female sheep in its second year. We saw that with the male sheep in their second year, they had a separate amount of libations. That's the Ayil. So what about a female one? Min ma de tanin an gedim meshamesh nechsei tzong gedolim uktanim zcharim unikevot had amra niske rachel ke niske gedi. Because it says that the gedi, it says in the Mishnah, it works for males, females, any age, except for the ram, it said. Therefore, it must be the U gets its own, uh, sorry, is part of that whole, it doesn't have anything separate, it's just part of the general, you know, of gedi. How do we know this? Dictiv, and now we're going to have a verse that's going to teach us all sorts of things about the libations, the nesachim, and one of them will be that the Rachel is exactly treated the same way a baby lamb would be treated, or a sheep, right? Then when it gets to its second year, it's called a Rachel, it's treated the same in terms of the libations. But we're, before that, we're going to get to all sorts of other things that are learned out from this verse. This is a verse in Prashat Korach which is right after the whole Korach incident, there's a whole section all about the libations. This is what you should do for the bull, the one or the ox, and the ram. Okay, the se is the female, and the kvasim is right, general sheep, and the izim are the goats. Why does it say to the one shore? It's to teach you there's no difference of the age between these. These are all treated the same, right? All the cattle are the same. Shayabedin, you might have thought, just like we said, right? That son and the bakar, maybe you're the same. And just like, since by the sheep, we distinguish between the first years and beyond that, the second and over years, Maybe we would say the same thing with the calves and the the bulls or the ox. From here we learn there's no difference. They're all treated the same. By the way, I read something about the sheep and, and their maturation process. And they specifically mature at a very young age. They hit puberty, usually around six months. Although it's somewhat dependent on the breeding season. And I thought that maybe this has to do with it. That they hit puberty very early and therefore they're really considered something different. And because of that, but why not six months then? Because it depends somewhat on the breeding season. So that will, in the course of a whole year, you'll definitely have them reach maturation. And maybe that's why they end up with separate libations. Um, anyway, I don't know enough about it, but I did read something about it. Ola Ayil, Lama Ne'emal. So now why does it say or for the ram? Shaya Bedin, again, you might have thought, now here you might have thought something different. Already we're distinguishing between the ram and the younger sheep. So, just like we make a distinction between the first years and the second year olds. Maybe we should also distinguish between the ayel and the year above it. In other words, maybe two, you know, within the second year is one thing. Within the third year is already something else. Therefore, it says, all Elim are treated the same. Once they're above the age of one, right, they're in their second year, they're already in Isle. It doesn't matter how old they are at that point, which makes sense. If we connect it to puberty, you don't have puberty twice. And here's the important part why we brought this in the first place. 
maybe make a distinction between the baby lambs and the ewes. Talmud Lomar, Ola Seba Kfasim. So there it says, the Seba Kfasim, and it doesn't matter if it's young or old, it's all the same. Obi Izim, why does it say, or by the goats? Lama Neemar, Shaya Bedin, Imatzanu Shechilek Ben Niskei Kevesu Niskei Ayel, Lekach Nachlok Ben Niskei Gdil Niskei Taish. Maybe we distinguish between a kid, a baby goat, and a grown goat. Maybe we would also distinguish Talmud Lomar, Oba Izim. They're all in one category. Hikish katan shebi izim, legadol shebi tayashim. In other words, since it said by izim, it meant everybody, they're all treated the same, doesn't matter the age. Mazeh b'shlosh elugin, afzeh b'shlosh elugin. Just like those have three log, these also have three log. Now we're back to the last part in the Mishnah, which is, since these tokens could get lost, I could drop my token, and at the end, you know, I can go and say, listen, I lost my token. And then they would look at the end of the day and see if the money matches the amount of tokens they have, and if they have more money than tokens, then I'll get my nisachim. And if not, then I won't. Because of that, they were worried someone might pick up the token and try to claim it was theirs. Now, if it's a day that I'm searching for my token, my missing token, obviously they won't be able to get away with it because I'll say, oh, that's my token. But that's why they would write the name of the day on it so they couldn't use it that day and that would prevent them from trying to use this token to get something when they never really purchased it. But the Gemara obviously says, But what do you mean? He could just wait. Let's say it said Monday. He'll wait till next Monday. And next Monday, there'll be no one searching for a missing token. He'll bring it and a claim that it's his. So, they didn't just write the date, the day of the week. They also wrote the koanim that were, that were working in the temple. If you remember, they worked 24 mishmarot. So, twice a year they were working in the temple, plus the holidays. But the name of the mishmar was based on those twice a year that they were working. So, they write, Monday, mishmar, so-and-so. And then, if you tried to bring it next week, everyone would know it's not legit anymore, right? It's not today's token. This is like tickets to a show, right? It says exactly the date so that nobody can come later and try to bring a ticket from a different day. So now it says, but that's not going to help because Agabat Smecha, if somebody really wants to cheat, what will they do? They'll save it to the next time, half a year from now, when that Mishmar comes up again. Shiziego to Mishmar. He can go and cheat the next time that Mishmar comes up and go on the Monday of that Mishmar and claim it's his. And no one will know. So, Shem Ayom, Shem Shabbat, Shem Chodesh, Hayakatuv Alehim. It said the name of the day, the name of the week, and the name of the month, and that would prevent people from doing it. I assume they think from year to year it's not going to happen. So here you have an example where the Mishnah seemed very simple. It just said you put the name of the day on. And it could be that in the eyes of the Gemara, that's clearly people are much smarter than that. And therefore, they just, you know they explain it in such a way that it was much more detail oriented. There was a lot more to it than what the Mishnah said. Now, whether that's true or not is a whole different story. But they're basically claiming that that won't help, so it must be that the Mishnah meant that they put more on it than they, than they claim. Okay, now we get to our section, which is really, really interesting about how to give charity, what's the best way to give charity, and the fact that the temple functioned not just as a place to worship God, but also as a place to take care of people, take care of the poor. Okay, and they had a lishka, we're going to see right now. Shtei l'shakot hayu b'mikdash. They had two places where people would bring items to the temple. Echat lishkat chashain. One was the, the lishka of the chashain. Chashain is usually to do something in secret. Okay, the secrecy chamber. Ve'echat lishkat ha'kelim. And one was for vessels. Lishkat chashain. Yer'echet notin letocha b'chashai. People who are God-fearing would bring money to there secretly. V'aniim b'nei tovim mit parnusim mitocha b'chashai. And the poor people would take money out of there secretly. Now, this doesn't mean they stole money from it. It means they would give to poor people in secret from this room. Okay, it was, that's why it was called secret, because this goes back to the secrets from yesterday. This is a different kind of secret. This is, we want to protect the identity of the poor. We want to protect the identity of the wealthier. We don't want everyone to know, oh, they gave charity. They gave this amount of money. They gave that amount of money. No, it was all done secretly. This reminds me, by the way, of the army. The army is a place in Israel where it's called Tzavah Ha'am, the Tzavah of the people. And it's it's known that the army is a place that also takes care of soldiers that come from troubled homes and they have all sorts of educational programs and, and other things. And, and even in a regular unit, there's someone always in charge of you in case you have an issue, if you need money. And it's, it's funny because the army, you wouldn't think it's a place, right? It's a place to defend our country. But it's, but it's a place where since already you're gathering all these different people together, 
they, there's a realization that we need to get involved and take care of the people who need help. And it's the same thing going on here. This is the temple. It's a place of worship of God. But it's not just about man and God. It's about man and his community and dealing with other, or woman in her community, and dealing with all sorts of other things that go on, socialist needs. So here there was a whole room that was meant for gathering charity. Um, okay, lishkata kelim. So how would that work? That had nothing to do with charity. This had to do with people bringing utensils to the temple. So anyone who wanted to give a utensil, donate to the temple, he would throw it into that room. I don't know why they use the word throwing it, but he would put it in. And once every 30 days, so once every 30 days, the treasurers who we learned about yesterday in this hierarchy of, of jobs, they were, they were the lower ones on the list. They would go into this room. They would sort the kelim, the utensils. They would say, okay, this we could use in the temple for something. This we can't. So anything they could use, they left there in the room and it was like a tool shed kind of thing. Anything that wasn't useful in the temple would, it's not only tools, by the way, I just kind of use that term, but obviously we mean bowls and spoons and things like that. But everything else that wasn't useful was sold and the money would go for temple upkeep. So it was kind of a donation room where some of the things were used for their, their exact needs and some of them were just sold and the money went to the temple. Now the Gemara is going to start off all sorts of stories about charity giving. Rabbi Yaakov, or Edi, Rabbi Yitzchak, or Nachman, Havu, Parnasim. They were Parnasim. We talked about that yesterday. The people didn't want to be Parnasim, right? They would give out the money. Vahavin Yatvin, Le Rabbi Chama, Avoid, Rabbi Yoshaya, Dinal. He would give, they would give Rabbi Chama, the son. By the way, you see, there were two people who were in charge of giving out the money, like we saw yesterday. It's important to have two people. They would give money to Rabbi Chama, the father of Rabbi Yoshaya, Adinal. That was the amount of money. And he would then give it to the people who need it. So here we didn't want the people who were handling the money giving it out, right? They wanted, they used an in-between person to basically make sure it was done more anonymously. This Rabbi Zechariah, very sad story. Rabbi Zechariah, the son-in-law of Rabbi Levi, would everybody would kind of laugh at him, make fun of him, mock him? Why? He doesn't need charity, and he, here they saw him taking money from charity, and they didn't. They, they said, "What are you doing taking money from charity?" This is sad because Mindadamach. This happens very often. Only once he died, he would take money from charity, and he would do, he would divide it up among all the people who needed it. He didn't take it for himself. But unfortunately, they only found this out once he was no longer alive. And during his lifetime, they mocked him and they thought he was taking charity for himself. Right? This is very often when people die, everybody finds out all these interesting things that they did in their life sort of secretly and nobody really knew about them. So this is a good story about him. I mean, it's a bit sad because everybody kind of pegged him as a certain type of person and it wasn't at all what he was. Rabbi Chin and Abar Papa have a mafleg mitzvah belelia. He would go dividing up charity at night so that nobody would see. To remember, in those days, nobody walked around at night. Um, Chazman, because it was very dark, right? Nobody would see. Everybody came home early, right before it got dark. So now, Chazman, Pagabe Rivhon de Ruchaya, the head of the evil spirits, bumps into him. Amar le, lo kach ilfein rebi, lo tasig vul re'echa. Didn't your teacher teach you, says to him, the evil spirit? that you're not allowed to trespass in someone else's property and it's nighttime and this is my territory right now. You can't be here. Amarle, but doesn't it say that giving secret, giving in, in secret will protect you? Meaning, right, this is like we've seen in other cases, shluche mitzvot eno nizokin, right? Anyone who's on the way to do a mitzvah will not be, will not get um, endangered. And I'm basically doing a mitzvah and it's probably, what did he think? Why are the evil spirits out at night again? Depends what you mean by evil spirits. Many times, the only people who are wandering around are people going to prostitutes and things like that at night. So that's why the evil spirits are around to kind of get those people. And he didn't realize that what he was really doing was a mitzvah. And he's trying to say, I'm not out here for the reasons you think I'm out here for. I'm actually giving charity. And that protects me. The evil spirit got scared of him and ran off. 
Here's a really good line. There's a, they're quoting a verse from Psalms, from Tehillim. And it says, it doesn't say, happy is the one who gives to a poor person. It doesn't just mean happy, but it means, right, good things will come to someone who does this. Happy is the one who is smart, it thinks about. And what does he think about when he gives money? How to give the money properly. And this is really, really important, right? It's, it's a challenge how to give money to someone without making them feel low and, and bad, that they need charity. It has to be done and handled in a very sensitive way. Someone who looks at the mitzvah and says, how can I do this properly? And it's not just about giving it secretly, but we'll see. What would he do? He saw someone, I know exactly how to translate, Ani ben tovim, but, a, but a, a poor person who was the son of good people, who lost all of his money. Haya omerlo, bini, bishvil shashamati, shenafla lecha Yerushami makom achir. I understand that one day you're going to have, ah, so they say that, thank you, Gita, noble descent. Okay, you could say it like that. And this is why he's going to say to him, listen, I understand one day you're going to have a big inheritance. You don't have it now, but you will at some future point. Tol at, tol va'at porea. So I'll lend you money now and you'll pay it back when you get your inheritance money. And then already the person feels like, oh, okay, I can handle this, right? It's just a loan. Mindahava nasiv, hava amrale, but after he gives it to him, he says, matanailah. Once he already gives it, then he says, by the way, this is really a gift you don't have to pay me back. That's the proper way to do it. Chia barada, it hava sabin biyomenan. Manda, okay, there were these elderly people. Manda v'yayv lahom mibain reisha shata l'tzom raba. The people would give him between, people would give these elderly people tzedakah between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Have a they would accept the money. Min batar ken, lo have But after that, they wouldn't accept any money. Amrin de shatan gaban. They would say, I already got my year's worth, right? God determines everything by Yom Kippur, how much you're going to have. I have what I have, and that's it. I'm not willing to take stuck anymore. Now, what's going on here? Some people say this is saying not only when you, Give tzedakah, you have to be thinking about it, but also when you take tzedakah, you have to be thinking. And I'll give you one interesting interpretation of this. There's many different ones about why exactly they did this. But one that I really liked was that the idea here is that they thought about how they can give schuyot to the people giving them, how they can merit those who give tzedakah. And the answer and the reason why they did this was they wanted to teach people, only give me charity in those 10 days, because those are the 10 days that we know, tshuva utfila tzedakah, Right, those three things, Mabirin et Roa Hagzera, they take away evil decrees. In other words, those are the times that people should be giving the most charity. So what they would tell people is only give us money in those ten days so that the people who are giving them the money will get the most merits. Again, there's different ways of interpreting it other than that, but that's one way. Nechemia is Shichin. This is a guy Nechemia who dug wells. It sounds like our Nechunya. Maybe maybe they are the same person and there's just a difference in how they say his name. But he dug wells or pits. Pagabo Yerushalmi, a guy from Yerushalayim, comes to him. Amarle zechei imi chada tarnagola. He says, I need a chicken, okay, a rooster. Okay, I really need one. Please give me. I'm poor. I need to eat. Now, you have to understand that to understand the story, you have to understand that in those days, okay, it happens sometimes that chicken was more expensive than meat. Okay, usually it's the opposite, but in those days, chicken was more expensive than meat. Amarle, I'm going to give you money that's going to afford you a piece of meat. I'm not going to give you to afford chicken, just a piece of meat. Zavan kupad, so he bought a kupad with the money, this meat, va'achil umit, and he died from eating it because he was, his body wasn't used to it. He really needed the, the chicken. So Nehemiah basically felt like he killed this guy by not doing the mitzvah stuck up properly. This is trying to teach you, right? You have to be careful how you do it, not just how you do it to not make the person feel bad, but also how you provide the needs of what this person needs. This person clearly needed chicken and not meat. And look what happened. You killed him. So Nehemiah was, you know, felt bad about what he did. Right? Go and eulogize this person that Nehemiah killed. Nachum Ish Gamzu, remember him? He's famous, Gamzu Litova, 
Okay, there's a whole debate about his name. Is his name Gamzu, the way it's spelled here, also him? Or is it Gamzu, which is the name of a place in Israel called Gamzu? And maybe he came from Gamzu. And maybe the story Gamzu Litova is kind of darshaning his name, but really his name was Gamzu. Um, so now they say, Nechobish Gamzu haya molich doron lebeit chamiv. He would give a gift to his, um, he, was, he was on the way to bring a gift to his father-in-law's house. Pagabo mukat shechin echad. So this poor person, who's a, you know, a mukat he has um, boils on him. He bumps into him. Amar le zechei imi mimadi itkabach. You know, guy comes down to him in the street and says, listen, I need, give me what you have. I need some food. Amar le michazer. On my way home, I'll give you food. You can already see where the story is going. Chazar ve'eshkachem meit. He gets back and the guy's already dead. Okay, now here he says the following. Nachumish Gamzu says about himself, he says, my eyes that saw you. Now I want you to remember this theme because we're going to see a lot about seeing and the importance of seeing things. And sometimes seeing things that can't really be seen. And the reverse, we're going to have this whole theme from here throughout the rest of the daf. We'll get back to it at the end. My eyes that see the lo yisbunach and didn't understand what was going on, yistamayun. I should go blind because look, I had eyes to see and I didn't really see the signs. Yade de lo lach. My hands that didn't, weren't outstretched to give you food, yiktaun should be cut off. Raglaya de lo rahatan lemetan lach. My legs that didn't run to give you food, yitavun should be broken. Umatetekein, and that actually happened to him, right? Crazy story. Selek like Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva goes to him. Rabbi Akiva was his student. Amarle, ili, e here means oily, like oy vavoy. Shani ro'eot chach bekach. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm seeing you in this terrible state. Amarle, eili, shani, she'en ani ro'eot chach bekach. I'm sorry for you that you don't look like I do. Bit, bit of a strange line. Amarle, ma tamakalalani, what are you trying to curse me? Amarle, uma at meva epi surin. Why, why are you trying to avoid Yisurin? And this is a whole approach that we've seen before, that there's this idea of Yisurin Shalahavan and how the Tzadikim want to get punished because they want to get punished so that they get punished in this world and all their sins will be kind of cleansed from their sins in this world and then they can get to the next world without any sins. So he, he accepted them upon him, kind of like Gamzu Tova, right? It's the same idea. I'm accepting this and this must be a good thing. Okay, now we get to an interesting story where Rabbi Yashai Rabbi, it's unclear how to read this. There's a few different interpretations, but I'll just read it one way, which is it's hard to know who, who's who, okay? His, either the rabbi of his son was blind, that is the teacher of his son was blind, or some people explain some other way, but let's just go with that. Vavayel, because it's not an important part of the story. There was a blind person who was maybe teaching his son Torah. And he would always eat at his table. Chadzman, havalei orchin, one day, Rabbi Yashaya had guests. And he didn't invite him to eat with him that day. Okay, now, Beramsha, right now, it could be, it sounds like he was embarrassed to show he had this blind guy sitting at his table. So he didn't invite him to eat. So now it says, In the evening, he went to the blind person to apologize. He felt bad for what he did. Don't be angry with me. Begin to have the because I have these guests today. I didn't want to embarrass you on this day because you're blind. You eat and you drip things on your clothes and it's embarrassing. I didn't want you to eat in front of all these people and be embarrassed. I was doing it for your sake, not because... I was embarrassed of you. I didn't want you to be embarrassed in front of them. Begin ken lo chalti marayomadein. That's why I didn't invite you to eat with me today. Amarle atapiaste. Okay, says, okay, you appease me. I understand. I'll accept this. Liman, now this is a kind of prayer we're going to see in a minute. Liman, here comes the big words. Liman dimitchame velo chame. To the one who is seen but doesn't see. Right? The blind person is seen and that's why he was worried how he was going to be perceived. But he doesn't see. Right? So he says, you appease the one who is not, who is seen but can't see. Here's the Chochmah. The one who sees but is not seen, which is God. Right? God is not seen, but God sees everything. So the one who is, it's a great line. You have to use it somewhere. But the one who sees but is not seen, 
Okay, he should accept your, in other words, I accept your apology. My wish is that God will also. Amarle, because really in the end, he did something wrong. It wasn't appropriate what he did. But he says, I, I understand you had a good reason for it. Therefore, I'll forgive you. And I hope that God forgives you. So to which Rabbi Yashaya reacts and says, Amarle, Hadamanalach, where'd you get that great line from? <laughs> wow, like what a great line. Amarle, mi Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. And here comes the great story about inclusion and, and a rabbi who really was way before his time about this concept. So he says, I got it from him. What's the story? A blind person walks into a city. He puts him, he seats him below him, okay? This is a way of giving him respect, okay? There was a way of seating, and he gave him a respectable seat. Okay, why did he do this? Sorry, I think Rabbi ben Yaakov sat under him. That must be what it is. He sat under him, and the, the blind person sat in a higher spot, right? Which gave him a, a sign of respect. He said, if I do that, people will assume what important person would be sitting higher than Rebbe ben Yaakov, if not that he was a really important person. So he put this blind guy in a particular spot. Now, the blind guy had no idea because he was blind, so he didn't know where he was sitting. So they gave him really good work to do, the people in the town, because they said, for Rebbe ben Yaakov respects him, then he must be really something special. Amar loan mau hachin. He realizes that he's making a lot of money for what he's doing. And he says, how did this come about? Like, what? I don't get it. Amar lei, Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, yativ l'raminach. They say, Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov sat below you. Vitzale Eloi had the So he realized what Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov had done. And he prayed. This is, by the way, it's the same idea of giving to someone beseiter. Like, the person didn't realize what he was doing. Right? And he was able to help him in this way. So then, this blind person prays for Rebbe ben Yaakov with the words of this prayer, and that's where the other blind guy learned it from. Right? You did a chesed for the person who is seen but doesn't see. So God should give you chesed for you know God being the one who sees but doesn't is not seen. Now we get another really interesting issue, which is very relevant. They were going to a big Knesset in Lod, where they saw this big Knesset in Lod. Look how much money my parents, my forefathers invested in this shul. Look at what a beautiful shul. They invested so much money. Such a respectable thing. Amar lei, kama nifashot shiku avotenu kan. It says, how many people sunk in this money that you invested in this? Okay, he's using the same word, shik'u, which means to invest. And he's using it to say, lishkoa is to sink. You sunk tons of people by spending, your father sunk all these people by what? Why lo havet eat b'nei nash, the island ba'oraita? Weren't there people who would have learned Torah had you given money to charity and supported these people who had to work their whole lives and couldn't find time to learn Torah? You would have increased Talmud Torah. In other words, don't spend your money on buildings and making fancy buildings when you can use that money to go toward giving charity, right? And specifically with a with a twist toward so people can learn Torah. If you give them charity, they'll be able to learn Torah. But also with this issue of charity, and this is definitely something that, you know, is a big debate. Is it worth investing to have a beautiful shul? It's respectable. And by the way, this is coming up in Masechet Shkalim, which is all about the temple, right? We have gold in the temple and all these other things, but this is a bit of a critique. Don't spend your money on fancy things when there's people who need that money and they could do things like learn Torah with it. Rabbi, this, by the way, is also in the rabbi's world, Torah was central. In the, in the temple world, the temple was central. So you could see why also in the time of the temple, they didn't value learning Torah as much as they did later when they didn't have any temple anymore. So it's just an interesting, it's an interesting, you know, question. Rabbi Avon Avid Ilin Tare, the Sidra Rabbi, he made the gates, he built the gates of the big Beit Midrash. Ata Rabbi Mana, like Abe Rabbi Mana comes, Amarle. Chame, again, we have this word, look, right? It's all about looking at what you see. Chame my avdi, go look at what I did. Look at my beautiful gates. To which Rabbi Manus says, Amar vayishkach Yisrael et oseu vayiven hechalot. This is a very harsh pasuk. It says the Jewish people forgot the one who created them and they built these hechalot, um, chamber, uh, sanctuaries 
for Avodah Zarah, for idol worship. Now, even though he was doing it for the Beit Midrash, he's saying, you're no better than those who spent all that money on idol worship, and they left God. Below have ben Nash, the Ya'alim Bal, right? So what, there were no people you could have supported so they could learn Torah? Also, very harsh words against what they did. Okay, getting back to other topics now. Tane, Kodshem Zbeach, Motzi'ina Tara'oi Lahem Mikodshem Bede Kabayet. What if you run out of Machatzida Shekel money? Can you use money from the Bede Kabayet? We were talking about the Bede Kabayet with the Kelim. Are you allowed to do that? Mahatanina, doesn't it say in our Mishnah? Klisha Matzu, oh, sorry, I skipped a line. But ain't Kodshem Bede Kabayet, Motzi'ina Tara'oi Lahem Mikodshem Zbeach. You have to read this a little differently then. It means Kodshem Bede Kabayet, if you need stuff for the Bede Kabayet, you don't, and as it's, the don't starts at the beginning of the sentence, but it really means don't take for Kodshe Berakabai, for upkeep of the temple, from the money that was given to the Machatzira Shekel, which was for the sacrifice. In other words, one can go for the other, but the other can't, right? It goes only in one direction. You can use Berakabai for the temple, for the sacrifices, but you can't use sacrifice money for upkeep of the temple. So now they say, but what doesn't our mission seem to indicate otherwise? Vahatanina, that's not exactly, but you'll see what they try to do with this. If you have these extra kelim that you can't use in the temple, you sell it and it goes to Beda Kabayat. Now, if Beda Kabayat money can be used for sacrifices, then theoretically it should have said, or you can use it for sacrifices. So I'm Rabbi Chizkiah, Kenim Anita Lishka Beda Kabayat. What it means is it goes into the Lishka, the area where you have the money for the Beda Kabayat. And if you end up needing that for sacrifices, great, you need it for sacrifices. And with that, Hajon Alach Perak Eluheinu Mimunin. I see some questions in the chat about, you know, what about Hidor Mitzvah and making a shul nice. It's not to say it isn't. It's just saying this Gemara is critical of people who do it. It also depends on what community you live in and how many poor people there are. I mean, obviously, there's always poor people in the world that you can be supporting. This Gemara is basically showing the other side of it. And maybe because we're talking about the temple and how much gold and money they collected and how much money was used there, they're trying to say, don't forget. And that's why we have this whole thing about the Lishka and the Beit Mikdash. Don't forget that we also have to give charity to poor people. Yes, we want our temple to look beautiful and the, the Kohen Gadol should be dressed in his beautiful garments. But you have to balance that with needs of the community. Okay, and so with that, we're going to start the new chapter. Chapter 6. Halacha Aleph. Shlosha Asar Shofarot. The common denominator between these next three things is just numbers. And this is Mishnah, mnemonics. Right? They used a lot of mnemonics to remember things. There's 13 Shofarot, where they would collect money in the temple. Shlosha Asar Shulchanot. 13 tables in the temple. Shlosha Shrei Shtachavayot. There were 13 places where they did protestations, bowings. We're going to see in the upcoming Mishnayot what all these 13 were, so we're not going to talk about that today. Shabbat Rabban Gamliel and Shabbat Rabbi Hanan Yaskana Kohanim. Remember him, Rabbi Hanan Yaskana Yaskana Kohanim. Hayum Shachavim Ba'arba Asre. They would, their families would bow in fourteen places. Ve'chanai Ta Yitera. Okay, instead of telling us where all the marks, we're going to get to that. Where's the extra one? And this is going to get us on our topic for the rest of the daf. Keneged Dil Ha'etzim. It was in the room where they kept all the wood for the altar. Why there specifically? Shekain Misorat Biadam. They had a tradition in their families. Mavotehen. Shesham Ha'aron Ignaz. That's where now the Aaron, the Aaron Kodesh, which we'll see exactly what was in the Aaron. The Aaron was in the first temple. It wasn't in the second temple. The whole big question this is going to be the debate in the rest of the Daf or part of the Daf. What happened to the Aaron after the first temple? Did it get taken by the Babylonians? Was it hidden somewhere in the temple? If it was hidden, where was it hidden? We're going to see three opinions. So according to them, their Masora it was, it was hidden underneath this room where they put all the wood. And by the way, the Kohanim were blemished, who couldn't work in the temple, would go through the wood, sort through and make sure there were no worms in there. Because if there were worms, it wouldn't be allowed to be used on the altar. So that's what they did in that room. And somehow the Aron was under there, hidden under there. Masebet, right, this is, we're going to, this next rest of the daf is like a scene out of Raiders of the Lost Ark, 100%, okay? So it's going to be that the Aron is hidden somewhere and has these magical powers. We're going to see how did they know it was under the Deer Ha'itzim. So we're going to see now. Masebet Kohen Echad, there's going to be a bunch of stories about this. There was an Asem, one Kohen. Shayam Itasek, he was just busy doing whatever. Vera'at Haritzpa, Shimashune Mechavalotah. All of a sudden he saw this area on the floor that was different from all the other areas on the floor. He we went to go tell his friend, look, what's going on here? There's something different. Before anything happened, he could even show his friend the spot. They didn't want anyone to see it. He died. 
okay? Because he couldn't tell over the secret of where the Aaron was. Obviously, this was a little bit different because that's where they had opened the ground, put the Aaron under the ground, and he died. Shesham Ha'aron Ganus. In other words, he died so that they would never really know where the Aaron was. Okay, Tani. Back to the Gemara now. We'll start for a quick second and then we'll move right back to the Aaron. Hashafarot halalu akumot hayu tsarot milamala nu rechavot milamata. We discussed this already. They were narrow at the top, wide at the bottom. Mifne ha'ramaim. Again, we're always worried about misuse of money so that no one can put their hand in and take the money out. Tani b'shem Rabbi Eliezer. We're now quoting a Tosefta in the Kelim. In the name of Rabbi Eliezer, they say, Ha'aron gala imahem lebavel. Here's a different approach. He says the Aaron was taken by the Babylonians. My taima, because it says, Lo yivater davar Hashem. God said, nothing is going to be left. What is davar? Ain't davar, ela shadibrot letocho. It's where the Ten Commandments are. Davar, dibrot. That's what it's referring to. V'chein hu omer, another pasuk. U l'tshuvat ha-shana shalach ha-melech nebuchadnezzar v'yivier bavela im klech and dat bet Hashem. He brought it to Bavel with the klech and dat, the special kelim of Hashem in the bet Hashem. Ezu klech and dat bet Hashem. Zeh ha-aron. Obviously, what's the most beloved? It's the Aaron. So that's where the Lucha were. Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish Omer, b'mkomo haya haron ignaz, third opinion, right? One is under the Gerei Tzim, one is it was taken by the Babylonians, one is, right, it was plundered, basically. The third is that it was buried in its place. The Aron was in the Kodesh Kodeshim, it was buried underneath the Kodesh Kodeshim. Hadau d'chtiv, how do we know this? It says, v'ya'arichu habadim, here, remember about the seeing and not seeing, here we go. V'ya'arichu habadim, this is the poles that they would carry the Aron on. They were seen, it says, but they didn't, they weren't seen outside. What does it mean? It was seen and not seen. They were seen but not seen. Right? They stuck out like the breast of a woman. Okay, there was like a thing on top and they, they jutted out from the parochet. But, so you could see them jutting out, but you couldn't actually see them. Because they were covered by the parochet. For Rabbanan Amre, Bilishkat dir ha'itzim haya ha'aroni kanus. They say, right? The rabbi said this goes back to what we saw in our Mishnah. It was in the in the wood, the room where they had all the wood. Maseh b'koyin achab amum. This is what we saw in our Mishnah. Shaya omed u'mefatzel itzim bilishkat dir ha'itzim. The ra'ah, right? He was basically splitting wood. The ra'ah taritzpa shumishtanei mechaverotel. He saw one part was different. Ba v'amar lechaveru. Right? This is Mishtane. This is different from the others. speak He died so that no one would ever know where it was. Tane Rabbi Yoshaya, a different version is he He tapped on the floor. Now either he was just randomly tapping, and all of a sudden a fire came out and burnt. Now either him or burnt. The cornus he was using, like a little hammer. Um, some people say he was tapping to see is it hollow, that he was actually looking for something. Okay, he had a sense that the Aram was there and he was checking. So anyway, two ways of reading this story, and this is already a different version of a different story. You could see how many stories there were. Like I said, it really sounds like a Raiders of the Lost Ark. Tane, Rabbi, right, obviously Raiders of the Lost Ark is based on these, right, it comes from these texts. Tane Rabbi Yehuda ben Lakishama. How many Aronot were there? So he says there were two. We're going to have two opinions, whether there was one Aron or whether there were two Arons. According to this opinion, Yudah ben Lakish, Echad shayta Torah netuna b'tucho, one had the Torah. V'achher shayu shivrei luchot netuna b'tucho, the broken luchot pieces. Zoh shayta Torah netuna b'tucho, haya munach ba'ol moed. The one that had the Torah sat in ol moed always. Had, right, we're talking about the time of the Mishkan. It's says they never left, right? They never went into the Machane. We know from some of the sources that the, the Aaron would go with them to war. So that must be the one with the broken Lucho pieces in it. And sometimes it was seen with them. Again, you get the seen and not seen issue going on. It was only one. It only went out once, because we do see it went out. Well, it went out that one time and it was taken into captivity, right? It was captured by the Plishti. Okay, so first a pasuk for Rabban. the rabbis, there was only one. The Plishtim say, oh my God, what is this? Like they're in shock. They've never seen anything like it. So, right? It must be something they never, ever saw because it never went out. 
And then there was only one, and it always stayed inside except for that one time. That there were two. Here's a pasuk. They're out to war, and he says, Bring me closer to me, the Aron Elohim. Hagisha means bring it close, meaning it's already with us. Just bring it to me here. But the Aron was in Kiryat Yarim. It was there for a very long time. It obviously wasn't with them in war, so it must have been to Aronot. My Abdul Rabbanam, what did they say? They say, oh, it was a box with something else in it. It wasn't the Aron Kodesh. It was a box that had the priestly garments, it had the Urim Vitumim, and it had the seats of the Kohen Gadol. That's what he wanted, and that went out to war with them, but not the Aron Kodesh. Here's a Pesach that supports him. This is what Uriah says to David when David tries to write with the whole story with Bathsheba. And then he says to Uriah, come home. And Uriah says, I'm not coming home. The Aron is out in Sukkot and I'm going to go home and be with my wife and be, you know, and not be out to war. So write a real, you know, critique of David. But what does it mean the Aron was in Sukkot? Right? The Aron was in, in, in Yerushalayim. Ma avdin le or bitzion. So my avdin le rabbanan. Schach shehu ki kiri. Okay, so he says basically, what do you see here? One was bitzukot, the Aram was out at war, and the other one was inside, in, you know, in Jerusalem. Schach, well, though it wasn't really in Jerusalem, then I don't think, well, whatever. Okay. Anyway, schach shehu ki kiri. So rabbanan, my avdin le rabbanan, what do the rabbis do with this? Schach shehu ki kiri yo, shadayin lo nimne beta bachira. Sukkot doesn't mean it was out in a hut. It means it wasn't in its permanent dwelling, which means because it wasn't yet a Benamikdash because we're in the time of David Amela. So there you have the other approach that there were really, it was really only one and he doesn't really mean literally it was out in the wild. No, it just doesn't have its permanent abode and that's why I'm not going home to my wife. Okay, I just want to add one little thing about the seeing and not seeing and I think this has a lot to do with the temple because the temple is all about there's parts of the temple we can see and there's parts of the temple we can't see and it's not so easy for people. They want to see everything and they want to get everywhere and not everyone's allowed into every area. There's Kodesh Kodesh and there's all sorts of interesting aspects that yes, there are things we see but there are also things we don't see and we always have to be cautious. I saw someone wrote also about this Dam Lechav It's the same idea with inter... Right? You never see what's going on in someone else's life. You should always be sensitive to the other because you don't really know what's going on. And that's just a good moral lesson that they're trying to get out of here and using the temple as a model for that, you know, that you don't always see everything and you don't have to always see everything, you know, but you have to understand that you're not seeing everything and that you don't see the whole picture. And you can go with that many different places. So with that, we'll finish for today. Some food for thought. Have a great day, everyone.